I started reading up about climate change and thinking more deeply about sustainability and felt this pretty serious disconnect between spending all my time figuring out how to solve problems on other planets when we have a lot of problems that are feasible to solve, certainly, on Earth. And when you work for NASA and one of your daily tasks is, you know, let's figure out how to catch a one-meter sphere orbiting Mars at Mach 2, these are super esoteric, challenging problems. These problems that we have on Earth feel not difficult by comparison. And I'm like, we got this. We could totally do this. Hey, folks. I'm Connor Gaughan, and welcome to Consensus in Conversation, a podcast where we're talking to the innovators, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who are committed to building successful businesses that also help us build a better world. When it comes to the work being done today in sustainability, a lot of it tends to fall in some pretty neat categories. We've explored many of them on the show, like regenerative agriculture, circular economy, electrification, and renewable energy. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's really encouraging. It means that for many of our biggest societal challenges, the broad strokes of the solutions are already in sight. There's a healthy debate over the particulars, how much and where we should allocate wind versus solar. And there's competition to bring these solutions to the market most affordably and efficiently, but that's all a good thing. It's the system working the way it's supposed to. But every so often, in exploring what's new in sustainable technology, you come across an idea that's so unique, so new and different and out of left field, that it makes you pause for a minute. First, just to get your head around it, and then to appreciate the incredible things that innovative thinkers can do with science and technology to solve problems that most of us haven't even thought of yet. Case in point, how do you transport energy over very long distances without relying either on unsustainable fossil fuels or prohibitively massive batteries? Well, traditionally, the answer to that question is alternative fuels, and that's usually meant either hydrogen or ammonia. And while either option is an improvement on unsustainable fossil fuels, both still have drawbacks, like reliance on complicated supply chains and difficulty in physical storage to transport those materials. So could we go a step further? What if there were an alternative alternative fuel option? One that solves all these issues by making use of an abundant, lightweight, and energy-dense waste product. That's the fascinating mission of my guest this week. Peter Goddard is the co-founder and CEO of Found Energy, a startup with a potentially revolutionary approach to decarbonized energy transport through waste aluminum. Peter is an MIT graduate with a doctorate in mechanical engineering and a former project manager for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He is one of the most exciting emerging thinkers in the energy field, and I was thrilled to have him on the show to share his vision. So let's get into the conversation. So let's just kind of start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, where you were raised. So I am from the great state of New Jersey, northern New Jersey, just outside of uh, New York City. Awesome. And uh, school, what, what were your kind of hobbies? What were you into? So throughout my life, I've sort of had this these split interests between music and art and uh, engineering and, and science and math. Up until my late teens, I would say, I really wanted to be a musician. I really wanted to work as a, as a jazz pianist. And a few teachers at my high school, though, and, and my parents and, and um, some other relatives strongly encouraged me to try something different. And, um, you know, around the time I was applying for colleges, I had been getting really into robotics, actually, at my at my high school. And I had this one teacher in particular who ran the robotics club. He also ran the the jazz band. And so he sort of roped me <laughs> in, in, into both of these things. Uh, his name is, uh, shout out, Mr. Divine. We were doing quite well in these robotics competitions and it really inspired this love of, of design and engineering and, and physics. So I ended up not going to music school, but going to MIT instead, where I studied uh, robotics. I mean, it is one of the finest uh, music programs in America at MIT, right? <laughs> You know, it's actually better than a lot of people think. And, and we're in Boston, where you have uh, these great music schools, and there, there's some interesting collaborations there. But, you know, it really does use that same part of your brain, that it's the same creative process. I'm curious, like, what is the overlap that you see between music and math, music and engineering? Like, how do those two complement each other, you think? In particular with jazz and anything that's improvisatory and, and requires any sort of extemporaneous creation, it really helps you confront the anxiety of the blank page. Like being a jazz musician, I grew comfortable with just starting, using whatever inspiration you have to just begin and, and let it evolve from there. And that's actually, I think, the most undervalued skill in 
design and engineering is you have this like vague set of requirements, this idea of a, of a problem that you're trying to solve, but you know, knowing where to begin can be really daunting. The key is to just start somewhere, anywhere you can you can sink your teeth in and then go from there. And, and then, you know, for me, it's just the same joy of, of creating. I find is fulfilled by both engineering and, and music and, and art. Yeah. Um, how'd you like MIT? MIT is an amazing place. The people like to say it's it's a fire hose of of information, and so uh, I was just exposed to so many uh, disciplines uh, of engineering and physics, and then also had the opportunity to just work with some some really amazing people, some amazing professors. Were there any particular professors or classes that stand out as just really memorable experiences? Oh, so many. But I'd say the the most useful classes I took were the the more design thinking, design engineering classes. Some of these classes are two semesters long, and they give you this, this general problem statement that, you know, MIT is actually good about partnering with um, different corporations and government agencies to actually give students a real meaningful problem that is something they genuinely want solved. And then they let the students loose and attempt to come up with a solution. So that was actually my first exposure into uh, looking at energy systems. We were looking at kind of new fuels for some humanitarian aid applications. Um, and, that, and that really got my wheels turning about uh, how we move energy around and just sort of the really complicated supply chain logistics associated with our energy economy. You held some really interesting internships over your time at MIT, too, that I think it sounds like also maybe helped inform found eventually. One of your internships also became your first job after college, I think, at NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So, yeah, it, it was a, a complicated path to getting there. I spent a lot of time bouncing around between majors and, and between you know, just the various things that I was interested in at MIT. And uh, I realized that sort of the intersection of all of that was actually robotics. And I sort of went back to my roots doing robotics competitions in high school. And actually, one of those robotics competitions uh, was actually a, a Mission to Mars-themed challenge where you would have to develop a robot out of like pretty simple materials to execute these complicated tasks that simulated you know, what it would be like to send robots to Mars. We, we had already done that at that point, but it was, uh, it, it, was, it was still a fun thought experiment. And then, you know, somewhat serendipitously, that was actually precisely my job after MIT was actually getting to work on and pilot the Mars rovers at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab out in California. That's amazing. Tell, tell us about that a little bit, that experience. Yeah, so like MIT, there was uh, the opportunity to do a lot of different things there. JPL is, is, is about 5,000 people working on probably 10,000 projects. The projects that I was most intimately working on were one, doing operations for the Curiosity Mars rover. So every morning I sat in that mission control center, similar to what you see on TV, analyzing the data coming down from the, the Curiosity Mars rover, determining if it was safe to proceed, and then based on the, the science objectives, figuring out you know, what was the best use of our time for the next Martian day, which we called a, a SOL. So that was really exciting. And at times when, when things were challenging, I actually had to live on, on Mars time, essentially. A Martian day is about 26 hours. And so <laughs> depending on where you are in the overlap, you could pull some, some pretty weird hours there. And then beyond that was working on some really forward-thinking missions to funky places in our solar system like Europa, which is one of the, the icy moons of Jupiter, which was really exciting. When you think about the Mars rover, I'm curious, like, uh, I think it's so... Such a foreign concept to a lot of people. You see the, you know, the headline when when it, it launches or when it lands, but I don't think people understand like what, what's the objective. What are we trying to learn? What's what is there to to gather from space exploration? That's such a great question. So, for one, by looking at places outside of our planet in our solar system, we can learn actually a lot about our planet. So, a, a lot of planets like Mars or, or Venus, at one point, were very Earth like. Uh, in terms of the the atmosphere composition, the the temperature, the atmospheric pressure, the magnetic fields, but what's cool is that they're at very different stages of development. So Mars lost its atmosphere a very long time ago because the strength of the magnetic field weakened. But we know that there were likely ancient rivers. We know that there's water ice on Mars even even to this day, and so there there was definitely quite a bit of water there. And so you know if we found life on Mars, that would 
teach us quite a bit about you know where life might have come from. If we found life on both Earth and Mars in, in a similar way, there's a good chance that it came from elsewhere in our universe, which would be really exciting. And so, you know, there's quite a bit to gain. I, I think with Mars in particular, we've learned so much over the last year. You know, of, of the planets in our solar system to visit, it's probably one of the most accessible just because the temperature and pressure are, are not that challenging to deal with from just an engineering perspective. Unlike going to Jupiter, where you have, you know, very corrosive, very uh, radiation-heavy, high pressures, high temperatures. Same with Venus. You know, with Venus is, is, is another interesting one because it also probably was quite Earth-like at some point and then underwent a very intense and uh, unstable greenhouse warming effect where the temperature and the pressure built up um, because of the presence of those greenhouse gases, which may be some foreshadowing for what's happening on Earth. So understanding sort of that transition could teach us quite a bit. Amazing. And it's at... JPL working for NASA when you first had the idea for, for found energy, right? Yes, exactly. So I mentioned Europa. One of the reasons that people are interested in going to Europa is that it's uh, basically a big ball of water ice floating around Jupiter. And because of the, the tidal flexing, because of the, the strong gravitational pull of Jupiter as the moon rotates, that flexing actually inputs enough energy to liquefy the water ice many kilometers below the surface. Uh, and because of the deep gravity well of Jupiter, people think that if we were to find life, and we, we know that the conditions uh, for life, you basically need energy and you need water and you need the basic chemicals for supporting life, which are basically ever found everywhere in the universe. All three of those conditions are present you know, under that ice sheet on Europa. Uh, and because of that gravity well of Jupiter, if, if we were to find life there, it would be unlikely to be the same source of life that could have seeded life on Earth or Mars or maybe some of these other places. And so it would teach us something about the abundance of, of life in the universe if we were to find life under there. That's why people are interested in it from just a, a scientific perspective. But it, it provides some really funky engineering challenges. For one, the ice sheet could be hundreds of kilometers thick. And we have to melt our way through that and do that in a way that, you know, will allow us to maybe get information back out. And, and we want to do that in a way that doesn't harm whatever life is potentially down there. And so, you know, when you look at sort of the energetics of that, like what is really energy dense enough to actually achieve that? Well, for most of that, you can get by with nuclear. You can imagine just taking a piece of plutonium, which as it radioactively decays, is heating itself up. So it's actually just this dense block of matter that's pretty high temperature. And you can imagine that sort of just melting its way down an ice column. But, you know, in, in the last couple of kilometers, you want to maybe take a different approach where you're, you're not irradiating whatever life might find down there. So I got pulled in on looking at some just orthogonal concepts for storing that energy. And by the time I got pulled into this project, people were thinking about using hydrogen, like tanks of, of hydrogen and oxygen to run a fuel cell to provide electricity. And, you know, hydrogen is really interesting because on a gravimetric energy density basis, so that energy per mass, it's one of the best, sub-nuclear. Um, and it's much more energy dense than something like primary lithium-ion batteries. But the problem with hydrogen is that it takes up a lot of space. So even if, even if you were to liquefy it, uh, which would be not really feasible for these applications, so you'd have to basically store it as a gas at 700 bar, it takes up just so much space and, and you, you wouldn't be able to fit as much in terms of payload. So while people are having this conversation, I'm recalling to my sort of basic chemistry knowledge that you can actually make hydrogen by reacting water with different metals. And what's one of the metals that we use in aerospace more than anything else is, is actually aluminum. And if, if you think about a, a spacecraft, when it lands and fulfills you know, its, its primary purposes, a lot of that aluminum is just sitting around doing nothing. Uh, and this is that first nugget of this idea of, of found energy, where you have energy stored in these materials that you might not think of as, as energy storage materials. And so I developed a program that basically gave these robots the ability to cannibalize these aluminum components they no longer needed for power for energy. Uh, and they would essentially react away with the water ice to form these little underground caverns of, of hydrogen gas that other robots could then come and, and refuel and, and support that way. I hope you won a prize for that. <laughs> Internally, <laughs> your bosses recognized how cool that was. 
they definitely thought it was an interesting idea, and they they gave me uh, some funds to to pursue it internally. But actually, the, you know, the nature of these NASA programs is that the, the farther out they are, the more subject they are to like political winds shifting, and that's exactly what happened in this case. The program wasn't continued. So, how did you transfer that idea? Where did that idea then shift to what would become found? So, you know, at at the same time I was doing this work, um, I, I was also having a bit of an identity crisis. Like, what am I doing with my time? I started reading up about climate change and thinking more deeply about sustainability and felt this like pretty serious disconnect between spending all my time figuring out how to solve problems on other planets when we have a lot of problems that are feasible to solve certainly on Earth. And you know, when you when you work for NASA and one of your daily tasks is like, you know, let's figure out how to catch uh, one meter sphere orbiting Mars at Mach 2. Like these are super esoteric, challenging problems. These problems that we have on Earth feel not that not difficult by comparison. Not as hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, we we got this. We could totally do this. It was at it's roughly the same time in the kind of you know mid uh, 20 teens where people were thinking about Mars as like a planet B. And as someone who spent literally every morning looking out the eyes of this Curiosity Mars rover at the Martian landscape, looking at the, the temperature and the, the lack of atmosphere and the lower gravity, you know, I am one of the most qualified people to say that it would be a terrible place to live. <laughs> <laughs> so you recognize that there's opportunity to help solve some of the big challenges we've got here. You've got this notion of a pretty unique energy source, energy storage system. So walk us through kind of when that becomes found and how you created found and what you set up to do at that moment. So throughout this um, th- this project, one of my collaborators has been this professor at MIT, Professor Douglas Hart. Um, and, you know, we had been toying around with the idea of, of using this for waste management, waste processing, and just for the various Earth applications. Like, w- when you look at aluminum as a spacecraft fuel, it's attractive because we're already using it as a material, but it's also really energy dense. It's actually more energy dense than even diesel. It's something like 20 to 40 times more energy dense than lithium ion. And on Earth, it's abundant. It's the most abundant metal in the Earth's crust. And so for you know all of the other things then that made it attractive to use as, as a spacecraft fuel made it really attractive for a, a global fuel on Earth as well. But there, there were some really key challenges that we had to solve around the time where I was having this identity crisis and, and realizing I wanted to shift my focus to these terrestrial applications. I had reached out to Professor Hart and he offered me a slot to come and do my PhD at MIT, where we together solved a lot of these remaining challenges around making the technology cheaper and safer and more efficient to the point where, you know, you could imagine this actually replacing fossil fuels. Right. Moving from an idea and a concept into something that's scalable as a business, perhaps. Exactly. And, you know, the tech was still at the point where it made sense to pursue that in an academic context. Um, there were still some some huge science questions where we're like, yeah, if we can't solve this, this is not going to work. And fortunately, we solved enough of those to the point where I was like, okay, now you know this is going to die in academia if we keep going down this route. It's time <laughs> to throw some you know the 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 weight of capitalism behind this and see uh, you know how far we can take this. And so that is how Found Energy, the company, came to be. So gets us to today. What's the mission statement for Found Energy then? So the the mission statement for Found is that we are literally bringing renewables to heavy industry. And emphasis on the bringing, that physical transportation of energy. If you look at the global energy supply chain, we move about 65 terawatt hours of energy as oil and gas every single day just by boat. And if you look at the heavy fuel oil that's used to run those boats and, and the, you know, the big container ships, we're talking like 300 million tons of this stuff every single year. So it, it's, a, it's a massive scale. It's a massive challenge. And you know, what people don't realize is like the gasoline that comes out of the pump at your gas station or the natural gas that comes out of your stove, it's a very impressive supply chain to actually get that to the point of use. And what's sort of implicit in that is that these resources are not distributed equally across the earth. 
we have a lot of oil and gas, but it's in it's in different pockets, and and you never know where one might pop up. And so it's actually a real benefit that it's quite easy to move around fossil fuels. When you look at renewables, you have a similar thing where it's not equally spread out as well. You have some places have more solar and wind, some places have geothermal, some places have hydroelectric. And when you look at moving that energy around in a similar way, we are nowhere close to where we need to be in terms of that transmission infrastructure. We certainly can't even handle today's load with just our electrical grid. If you look at places like California with very consistent rolling blackouts, to just entire countries who are energy poor, like Japan, South Korea, even countries in Central and Western Europe like Germany are struggling to even get fossil fuels, let alone a steady stream of, of renewables as they look to decarbonize. So how, do you, how does Found address that? So this is where we have that same first principles conviction about aluminum that we've always had. Like in order to rise to solve this challenge, we need something that's scalable, abundant, safe, energy dense, cheap, and can be produced with electricity. All of these things are true about aluminum as an energy carrier. And so we are specifically tackling that point in the in the supply chain where you would need to then extract energy from aluminum. So maybe you know taking a step back like the way aluminum is produced today you take bauxite ore you extract aluminum oxide from that and then you pump a bunch of electricity into it via what's called the hull harrow process and that electrochemically reduces that aluminum oxide to aluminum metal. Our process can actually extract 70% of the electrical energy that goes in that hull harrow process as heat. It's a very flexible process where because we're reacting aluminum with water, we actually get hydrogen at an intermediate step. So we can tap out pure hydrogen if, if different industries are interested in that. But at the end of the day, we're producing thermal power. And we do this in a way that is cheap, scalable, and at an extremely high power density, which means that we can build small, compact, we call them reactors, that take in aluminum continuously in water and, and, and produce high-grade steam and, and hydrogen. What are then the use cases for that? How does that make its way to market, in theory, as a product? We're focused these days on, on the most difficult to decarbonize industries. These include industrial heat at a variety of temperatures. About a fifth of, of global carbon emissions come from roughly that application. We're looking at things like maritime shipping. How do we replace that 300 plus million tons of fuel per year for that global supply chain, which is not going anywhere? Ships are still the best way to move things around. And looking at longer term applications where say what you will about the hydrogen economy, but one of the things that's certainly holding it back is the difficulty in transporting hydrogen. And so by virtue of us being able to produce hydrogen from water on site, instead of transporting hydrogen, you could transport the materials needed to make that hydrogen and then make it on site and sort of get around the complications that way. And if you can do that at scale, you can solve problems around like refueling long haul trucks in the middle of nowhere. When you think about synthetic hydrocarbon fuel production, the ingredients are hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and green electricity. Very rarely do you find all three of those in one place geographically. You'll always have to move one of those things. And so we can at least help with the hydrogen and, and maybe some of the thermal energy needed. I mean, hydrogen is getting subject of a lot of conversation these days, especially in D.C. I think a week or two ago, a bunch of money was allocated for hydrogen hubs. I'm just curious for your kind of take on that. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, hydrogen is widely used today. It is a feedstock chemical for many different heavy industries. Fertilizers, for example, you have to make ammonia. It's made via the Haber-Bosch process, where they take nitrogen from the air. They make hydrogen today via steam methane reforming, and then they react it to produce ammonia, NH3. And so if you look at the carbon emissions from the hydrogen supply chain today, they're substantial. And so we need to deal with that. Like We're always going to be using hydrogen. And so I think a lot of these hubs are already strategically located in places where the hydrogen demand is already there. And they're now just encouraging different ways of producing that hydrogen. Oddly enough, one of the biggest users of hydrogen today are actually oil refineries because they're used to refine the long hydrocarbon chains and into like the various petroleum-based products we use today. 
And so conveniently for, for them, a lot of these hubs are, are also co-located there. So th- there's kind of an, an interesting philosophical question that emerges, you know, like, are, are we helping the oil and gas companies continue producing? You can have that conversation all you want, but the reality is it would have a large impact if we could decarbonize their hydrogen production in the short term. And the reality is fossil fuels aren't going anywhere fast. Yeah, I mean, this is a transition and a long one that we've got to be innovative for the long term to succeed. Exactly. So all this stimulus around hydrogen development, production, demand is, I think, a huge net win for the industry. Yeah. Now, clearly, you've got an exceptional amount of of love for the engineering, for the chemistry. I'm curious, as a founder, as a leader, how you balance kind of the outward-facing duties, let's say fundraising, with working in a lab, working with technology. Like, How do you find that balance? In, in terms of what I like to do with my time, I would love to be in the lab. I would love to be hands-on working at a lathe or a mill, producing parts for these different reactors that we're building, You know, thinking about the chemistry. But I also really care about doing the things where I can have the most impact personally. I mean, if you roll back to my first job out of college, that was literally my dream job. Like I was playing with Mars rovers in high school and before that, and then I get to play with the real thing. And I loved working there. I absolutely loved working there. And so it tells you about what I'm willing to do to throw that all away, to go do something that is objectively much harder, and it, like namely getting a PhD, and much <laughs> can be much less rewarding, to do something where I just felt like I, I could have a, a more positive impact. And so I am completely fine with the choices that I've made and, and very excited about them. And so, you know, I, I'm doing what, it, what needs to get done. That's, I think, what everyone's doing along the chain of command And uh, hopefully my team, everyone feels like they're in their position where they are most effective and and most impactful. And and for me, I'm the one out there telling the story and drumming up support for this new idea. And and it's very difficult, but it's a story I really want and enjoy telling. Yeah. I've had a couple of great conversations with founders who come out of engineering or are engineers, I should say, present tense. And I generally found they have a a bit of a different perspective on management that's rooted in their engineering training and background. I'm curious how you look at your managerial and leadership style and how you see, do you see reflected in that your history in engineering? Yeah, I mean, for our, our company, I mean, the way I was taught engineering management was at NASA, where you have like a million design reviews and you spend a lot of time in, in PowerPoint presentations and going over design requirements and all of that is just to make sure all of the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed. Because when you launch that thing into space, there's no going back. You're not going to go up there and you're not going to fix it. And so I initially wanted to apply that same logic because it's, it's very successful, right? Like no other organization has landed so many devices on, on other planets. And I actually found that it was not the right approach for an early stage startup and, and for my team in particular. We needed to be a little scrappier, we needed to be able to adapt much more quickly. And so like having all these design reviews uh, can actually sap some valuable time away from actually just thinking about the problem. And you know, the, the reality is that the requirements are not as set in stone uh, when you start a company versus like a very well-defined science mission on a, on a different planet. So all that to say is I kind of let the team evolve and adopt the management style that works for them. I would imagine there's been like a bit of a crash course in the actual business side of things. So I'm curious what lessons you've learned, you know, in that capacity. Yes. I mean, you like, unfortunately, learn a lot of things when when things go wrong. So like, I'll be honest with you, I didn't fully understand what a bank was until we put all of our money in Silicon Valley Bank. And there was that that scare there earlier in the year. That was a, a definitely a, a big wake up call. And, and, and thankfully, we were okay. And, and as were many other companies. But, you know, just there's some pretty basic, like, operational side of, side of the business that you kind of learn on the go. Um, thankfully, my co-founder, uh, Gadi, he's uh, actually a seasoned startup entrepreneur. And so he brings a lot of that wisdom to the company. And I've actually learned quite a bit from him. He, he's our chief business officer, but had been CEO at, at previous companies. And so we've sort of leaned on each other a little bit. Him to get more to speed on, on the technical side of things. And, and he's helped bootstrap some of the business acumen that you need to have. Speaking of that business acumen, I'm curious, 
what the process has been like to be out there in the market. You talk about having your money at SVB. What was it like for you to be out there in front of venture capitalists and and in the capital markets? And particularly when you have such a, a, in some ways, an esoteric and technologically complex story. Yeah, you you hit on like a, a really interesting dynamic of this process. So like, at the end of the day, it really is storytelling. But people come, like the listener comes with all of this, with different background information, you know. And so the story that I would tell in academia is very different from the story I have to tell to a, a VC or, or to someone in, in heavy industry, a you know, potential customer. And it took me a long time to realize that as a society, the concept of a fuel is actually very well hidden from the average user, right? When, when you go to the pump, you know you're just like putting this thing in your car you're waiting some amount of time. You know, you probably know gasoline is going in there. But at the, at the end of the day, you're not really thinking about like what's the energy density and, and what's the power density of that system and what's the supply chain that's required to get that energy to you and, and why is it so difficult to do anything different from that? And so like I find I, I spend a lot of time just teaching people what a fuel is, what a redox reaction is. Like some things that are like perfectly acceptable for people to not know because it's at the chemistry level, it's actually quite complicated. And if, if you don't use it in your day-to-day life, why would you need to know about it? So that's been fun. And I, I spent a lot of time in, in education throughout my life at the Media Lab. I, I used to teach thermodynamics at MIT. And so thankfully, I actually enjoy educating people and, and teaching people about some of this more basic chemistry. But it, it, it means that these conversations can take quite a bit of time. You, you really have to be patient. You kind of talked about this at the very start Fundamentally, your mission is rooted in you know, addressing a pretty critical systemic challenge that Earth has. Um, and I'm curious how you think about sustainability as part of your business uh, mission. When you think about using aluminum as a, as a global energy carrier, there, there's a couple of things that will need to be true about the world. For one, if you just look at the carbon intensity of aluminum globally, it's actually quite high. And that's because it's very electricity intensive. Most of the world's electricity, if you look on kind of an average basis, is produced via fossil fuels, coal, natural gas. Because aluminum is so energy intensive to make, that's actually really good for us. But what it means is that people who make aluminum are people who have access to the cheapest electricity. Now, that's for a long time has been coal and and natural gas, but increasingly it's becoming hydroelectric. So some of the biggest aluminum producers in the world are the Canadians, Brazil, Iceland, where you have access to really cheap renewable energy. And that's not because they want to make the world a better place. That is literally just like economics. That's exciting to see. And so we want, we need to see more of that for us to really scale in the long term. And there's still some, some carbon emissions scope two and, and three associated with these all these supply chains, which is true about any green technology today that we need to confront head on. And, and so we're not ready to go out and just buy primary aluminum and turn that into a fuel because there's a chance that in the in the short term that would have a net negative impact. And so we are choosing to not do that, even though we could, even though it makes sense economically, we're choosing not to do that because it will not actually benefit the world in the short term. So instead, we're actually focused on taking low-grade aluminum waste that is difficult to recycle because it's too contaminated. Maybe it has mixed alloying elements. For one reason or another, it's ending up in landfills or it's being exported to a country where manual labor is cheaper and it can be sorted. And then even, even then a lot of it's landfilled as well. So that's where we're, we're starting. And you know, for every source of aluminum we interact with, we, we really look carefully at like, is there a better thing that can be done with this particular stream? Like we're not taking used beverage cans, for example. Because when you break it down, even using our process to make a new used beverage can, it's slightly more carbon intensive than the standard way of recycling. So we're letting them do that. But there's a million other waste streams of aluminum that are maybe slightly harder to get our hands on, but will have a a much more positive impact on the world. How do you think, I guess just broadly to take a step back, about the larger scheme of the clean energy transition? Like, How how do you fit into that? and And how do you think about, you know... I've heard folks like you know Bill Gates will say, we need every resource. We need to be pursuing all these paths because fundamentally the amount of energy we consume is going to require every green solution we can possibly come up with at scale to succeed in the transition. But how do you see or think about 
your role in the transition? Yeah. So, I mean, climate change is all about sort of competing timescales. Like all of the energy that we use today, the fossil-based energy, is, is, is basically solar energy that was stored over many millions of years. And we're basically trying to compete with that in the span of, of decades, which is, is actually insane. And so, yes, we, we, we will need a million different ideas to also deal with just the million sources of carbon emissions. I mean, even if you look at fossil fuels, there's like many different types of fossil fuels. Each are suited to a different application. So it's, it's, it, there cannot be one technology, almost by definition, that would be a, a panacea to solve all of this together. And the way I like to break it down is that we need production of energy. We need ways of storing that energy. And we need ways of moving that energy around. And where we're focused is partly on the storage, but really on how you move that energy around. And I genuinely believe that aluminum is one of the best ways of moving things around. There's many great ways of storing energy. And aluminum is a great way to store energy because it's basically inert until we apply a process to it and make it water reactive. And so you can like leave it sitting around for thousands of years and, and basically nothing happens to it. But really where it shines is that it's, it's quite easy to transport. Over the last couple of years, you know, we've folks, at least in, in D.C., but even at the states across the country, are beginning to think about how they can better support the, tra the transition to cleaner energy. I'm curious if there's any kind of policy or legislative things that you've seen, heard, that you look at, interventions that you think are positive towards building the scalable future. I think what we're seeing in the U.S. is, is very encouraging. All the money going into very early stage projects through the ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, and then later stage at the like loan programs office in, at the DOE. I think there could be a little bit more support for companies at our stage where we have proven out a lot of the scientific challenges and we're just looking for capital for basically CapEx to do pilot projects, where we don't want to go out and get like a $750 million loan to make a giant plant because we still have some engineering challenges. But at the same time, we need more than like the 500K to a million that you could get at RPE, where they're looking for just like getting higher TRL technology readiness level, basically going from that like just past lab scale. And, you know, we're somewhere in the middle and, and venture capital can be a a good way to bridge that gap. But, uh, you know, with the uncertainty in the economy, you know, maybe that's a less attractive asset class these days and it's it, it cannot, it, maybe it's not as flexible. So I, I really think, you know, we need a little bit more support at, at that stage. You guys are, have also talked a lot about kind of humanitarian aid components uh, that you're involved in. I'm curious what that looks like and, and what kind of initiatives and programs you're most excited about in the do-good side of the business. Yeah, for sure. I really believe that as we are figuring out how to clean up the way we produce and, and consume, we do need to deal with the mess that we've already made. The climate has changed. We're seeing this with the variability and, and, and increased intensity of, of severe weather events. And I think we need to be putting more resources as a society into climate change adaptation like helping people and climate change impacts different groups of people different ways. And, and unfortunately, folks that are already disadvantaged economically tend to suffer the most from this. So as a company, we're trying to do our part there by looking at ways you can use our technology for disaster relief. So when you have, uh, this was actually inspired by a, a trip I took to Puerto Rico shortly after Hurricane Maria, where I noticed that there was all this aluminum waste all over the place from damaged car parts, from building materials, the sides of, of buildings, roofs, those are all aluminum. And they're just stacking them up in these landfills. And that's a huge amount of energy sitting there doing nothing. And because our process produces hydrogen, but it's also very exothermic, it's actually well suited to do combined electricity generation and also desalination. So we've had some projects, one of which was sponsored by uh, USAID, to look at using our technology for that purpose. And, and you know, we're committed to going down that path and, and seeing if we can scale that as well. That's awesome. There's skepticism, I think, and many folks see headlines every day about the impacts of the climate, changing climate, you know, whether that's severe weather events or just the data coming out of kind of big research reports. And I think for some, when you read those headlines, it's really easy to feel like there's no point in trying. So the, the challenges are too big, it's too hard. And 
I'm curious how for you to talk about why it's important for you to be out there innovating and how you see the potential to solve challenges and problems like these big ones, whether that stems out of your, your time looking at big challenges like landing a robot on Mars or simply the work you do every day now. Like, How do you think about innovation, adaptation, resilience as a, as a solution towards what I call defeating defeatism? I think it's true in part that what we're doing now is, is a little bit of damage control. I think we've probably passed a few tipping points. But for me, that means it's actually even more important to do this work and stop it from getting even worse. And then the other thing is, like, I genuinely believe this is a solvable problem and that we will emerge not without some scars, but we will, as, as humans and hopefully in, in harmony with some of these other ecosystems, we will emerge from this having curtailed or solved the problem to some degree. And I also see this other benefit where a lot of the technologies we're employing to solve these problems are just better technologies. Like, when we emerge from this hellscape, hopefully not too damaged, I think it'll just be a better place to live. Like, we're not releasing pollutants into the air. We're not damaging these ecosystems. We really are living more harmoniously with nature, and, and we're treating each other better, and, and we're not fighting over resources. I think when you solve these problems, because we have to, that the way in which we're going to do it is just going to be better for everybody. And, like, that's a world I want to live in. I'm curious someone with your visibility into what's getting done out there in these technologies with your engineering perspective. I'm curious what you're seeing, what innovations you're hearing about, what fields of research you're looking at beyond what you're doing in climate tech and sustainability and thinking, oh, that's interesting. Oh, wow. Like, What are other things out there that folks should be paying attention to? Yes. I, I could talk for a very long time. It's sort of a self-serving way about the, <laughs> the technologies that will help my business directly, but I'll, I'll leave those aside. And Orthogonal to that, the things I'm really excited about, I think we're just scratching the surface in supercharging nature-based solutions, essentially. So looking at down the line, like microbe engineering, geoengineering and advanced weathering, how we can clean up plastic waste, sequestering CO2 from the atmosphere, reducing radiative forcing, ocean-based carbon capture is super exciting to me. But just like how can we use these really robust and existing geological, climatological pathways to kind of supercharge our efforts. I think that's a big lever that we have to be very careful about deploying, but is there and, and all, like all options should be on the table right now. Yeah. I mean, let's spend a few minutes on the ones that directly impact you. What, what are some of those that you're excited about? So for one, just in the aluminum smelting world, there's some really exciting technology called the inert anodes, which allows you to make aluminum with basically no emissions whatsoever. So you don't have to worry about carbon capture or anything like that. That is supposed to come online at scale in the next couple of years. Um, I'm really excited about daily electricity storage so that you can smooth out the demand curves from solar and wind. That actually enables you to make aluminum using virtually any renewable energy input. Aluminum smelting is done at high temperatures, and so it's not super well suited for solar and wind. You have to use base load renewables like hydroelectric, but that would really open up the floodgates there to make aluminum in basically anywhere you would have lots of solar. So like Australia, the Middle East, places that are already exporting a lot of fossil fuels, you could give them something else to sell. Yeah. Um, if folks want to learn more, where can they get, get more of this? This is really interesting. Yeah. So uh, for one, if you want to learn more about Found Energy, you can visit our website at found.energy, F-O-U-N-D, dot energy. Given my background in music, people always think I'm saying sound energy, but it's, <laughs> it's not sound energy, although we should probably get that domain name. Uh, it's Found Energy. Uh, follow us on LinkedIn. You know, we're, we're about to be hiring soon, so stay tuned for that. And then zooming out a little bit, if you want to just learn more about climate change and what energy really is and what fuels are, I've actually written a textbook on thermodynamics and climate change that's available on MIT OpenCourseWare. So if you just search Peter Goddard, MIT OCW, thermodynamics and climate change, you'll find this book that I wrote and that should help you get up to speed. So if you're a VC and want to come talk to us, please read that first. Awesome. Thanks so much for taking the time today. It's been a lot of fun and I can't wait to watch you guys' success in the future.
Once again, a huge thank you to Peter Goddard for joining us today on the podcast and bringing us up to speed on this new way of thinking about energy transportation. I feel like we've gotten a crash course in some of the literal rocket science, and I can't wait to see where this technology goes. If you want to learn more and continue following Peter's work or are interested in joining Found Energy as a team member, their website is found.energy, or you can connect with them on LinkedIn at Found Energy. For you deep divers, we'll also include a link to Peter's book and his mentioned in the show notes. On the podcast housekeeping front, I'm very excited to announce that we've got a dedicated show email finally. So if you've got questions, comments, or ideas that sparked by today's conversation, or you've got a great idea for a future conversation, email us directly at cic at consensus-digital.com. That's cic at consensus-digital.com. So go ahead, drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. You can also connect with me directly on LinkedIn and Instagram at ckgone. And if you like the show, please give us a follow, a like, or leave a review wherever you listen. It really helps us to grow our reach and continue bringing you more awesome conversations with business leaders that you want to hear from. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Consensus in Conversation is hosted and executive produced by me, Connor Gaughan. This episode was produced by Will Gatchel and Jeff Rock with editing from the good folks at Reasonable Volume. Special thanks to the Consensus team, including creative director Kate Tucker, Greg Hergel on research, and Patrick Gallagher on strategy. Consensus in Conversation can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen. Consensus in Conversation is a podcast by Consensus Digital Media, produced in association with Reasonable Volume.